Good evening, and thanks for joining me for my talk on subdomain hijacking, uh, why DevOps is making us more vulnerable. So before we jump into the topic, who am I? So my name is Simon Gurney, I'm a co-founder at Punk Security. We're a DevSecOps uh, company here in the UK, based in the North East. Uh, I'm a DevSecOps consultant, still do consultancy um, as, a, as the company's grown. Still very much a, a geek at heart, so very technical. Uh, a Python developer, also a security guy, came from an infrastructure background, so um, really quite broad skill set. And what's the agenda for this evening's talk? Um, so first we'll go into quickly how DNS works. So we're going to look at what does the infrastructure behind DNS look like, what do some of the common records look like, and then what are the um, what happens when you request a, a DNS record for a website. So you go to a website um, or you're trying to connect to a server, whatever that may be, you, you punch in a human friendly name and it resolves it to an IP address. But how does that work under the scenes? Because that's going to be important when we start talking about how we attack that. Uh, we're going to go through two methods to attack subdomains. Um, typically, we, these there's, there's plenty of different um, SaaS platforms we can try and attack, but typically they fall into two methods. So we're going to cover both those methods this evening. Um, one we're going to demo against GitHub Pages and one against um, AWS. And then we're going to quickly touch on why should you care. So um, when we understand what are subdomain hijacking attacks, um, why should you be interested and why should you try and prevent it? And uh, what can you do to defend your organization? So it's not all doom and gloom. At the end will show that it's actually quite simple to keep on top of this stuff. So uh, let's kick it off and intro to DNS. So what is uh, DNS? We're going to go to the infrastructure first so you understand what actually is uh, responsible for making DNS work. And then we'll have a look at what, how DNS, the process itself works. So DNS starts with some routing servers. There's 13 of these servers all dotted around the globe. Typically, mostly centered on the US actually, like the US Army runs it and I think NASA's got some. Um, so these are fairly static servers, really high load tolerant servers, really highly available. Um, they are hard coded onto um, DNS servers. So if you deploy a Windows DNS server, um, for instance, there'll be an option to use root hints. So these are hard coded IP addresses where it knows that it can go to start the whole DNS journey of how do I resolve a domain name. So if it hasn't got anything in its cache or no other direction, the root hint server is where it's going to start its journey. And as I said, that's generally hard coded into the applications. It doesn't change very often. Uh, and what do these routing servers hold? So they have a record type called a name server record, and they point at the DNS servers responsible for what we call a top level domain. So these you recognize as .coms, .orgs, .co.uk's. So the very top level of a domain that is maintained by an organization. So .co.uk here in the UK is maintained by Nominet. So they will have their own DNS servers. So the job of the routing server is to point people when they're after a .co.uk domain at nominates.co.uk uh, servers. So these are the TLD servers. So as I say, we've got .co.uk there by nominate, and we have these name server records pointing at the TLD servers. The routines aren't going to get updated that often, only if nominate decide to change their IP addresses for their .co.uk servers. Or recently, you probably noticed there's a flood of TLDs. We, we used to be just you know, .com, .co.uk's, maybe 100 TLDs. Now there's thousands. You can get .kitchen. Um, dot security, dot shop, uh, dot Google. Uh, it's, it's exploded recently, the number of TLDs. And then the TLDs will have the same NS records, but this time they're going to point to their customers' domains. Um, and then they're going to point to wherever you've told them you're hosting your DNS records. So in this case, we're .co.uk again. So we're over at Nominex. We've purchased a domain, test.co.uk. And we've told Nominate that we're serving that from Azure. So if someone wants to go and find our website, they can look up our DNS records over at Azure. So we tell them that we they provision NS records or we provision it via their web interface or whatever mechanism they've got. And then they can then point all people at our Azure servers, which we can update as fast or as slow as we like. So on our servers, we're going to have more records than NS now. So we're going to have A records, which are how to turn a name into an IP address, quad A records, which are how to turn a name into an IPv6 address, C name records, which are kind of like a, a, a reference. So you get C name records to another DNS record, and you may even start that whole journey again for, for an alias record, or NS. So we can do the same trick 
that the registrars are doing um, and say actually this part of the domain you can go and fetch from another server. So those are typically the records. There are more uh, text records and mail records and we don't mean to concern ourselves with that for subdomain hijacking but we'll cover these records again as we go through. So that's what the infrastructure of DNS looks like. So when you purchase a domain and you pay in a registration for each year of 10, you know, 10 pounds a year, some nominal fee to nominate or whoever your registrar is, that's because maintaining these TLD servers is expensive. They have to maintain who is records, which are who owns the domains. And then they have to keep this really highly available infrastructure up because if their servers go down, if that .co.uk DNS server was to break, your website would go off. Yeah. That's not quite true, it wouldn't be that instant, but if they were down for a long time, then that would happen. So, so when you purchase a domain, you're basically funding that process. And generally these orgs up until recently when the TLDs exploded are non-profits like Nominate, which are public sector owned. So that's the infrastructure behind DNS. So when you purchase a domain, what you're effectively doing via your registrar, whether that's GoDaddy or directly with a, um, a, register, like a, a domain provider, is you're paying to have your uh, NS record and your details put on a TLD server. And then when you create subdomains, so you put a domain test.punktsecurity.co.uk um, and you've decided to create a subdomain of uh, test, then you would configure that in your DNS records. That's free. Um, you can have as many of those as you like, but to actually buy a domain to go on .co.uk, you can have to pay for. Uh, so just to go over that again, root hint servers, no one's got any access to those other than the bodies that manage them. Uh, the TLDs, you do indirectly configure via the registrar. So you go onto your registrar, go daddy and say, my domain's available on these NS records. Uh, and you can configure that directly generally. So you can configure them, but it's via the registrar. Normally it's a 24 hour delay um, for that to fully propagate. Um, but that, and that's the only real access you get. Whereas the, the Azure layer or wherever you put your DNS servers, you can configure that how you like. Really easy, really quick. So that's the infrastructure behind DNS. And now we're going to look at the, how the DNS flow goes. So we've got a laptop here and it wants to go to uh, my website, www.punksecurity.co.uk. So I type that into the URL or you know, I go on Google and search us and that comes up. And then the computer's got this task now of, I've got a human friendly name. I need to connect to a server somewhere on the globe that's going to serve me this website. How do I turn a human friendly name into an IP address? An IP address is structured in such a way that given that IP address, the, the traffic that goes to that server can work its way around the internet. That's the whole point of IP addresses. They're fairly hierarchical. So given an IP address, a computer can work out where on the planet it needs to get that, get that, um, that, that data to. So we need to turn that human friendly name, which isn't hierarchical, into uh, an IP address. So we, at this point, the laptop um, is connected to like a BT home hub. So its DNS records are with BT. BT is maintaining some DNS servers that allow its customers to then uh, use. So uh, this is fairly automatic behind the scenes. Some organizations will um, have like their own way. Protected DNS is quite common now where they do like malware filtering at the DNS layer. So you make a DNS request and it says, oh, it's malware. So I'm not going to bother responding or I'll send you to a different page that says that's malware. But typically in a home environment, you're just going to get served whatever your ISP is providing. So in this case, the re my request goes off to the DNS server at BT. Uh, the DNS server at BT says, uh, where can you start code at UK? So how do I start this journey? So it goes off to those routing servers and says, where is code at UK? Um, and then that responds to that NS record we talked about. So back to BT and says, if you want to find code at UK, you need to go to the nominate servers in the NS record. So now we go to the nominate server and we say, where is punksecurity.co.uk? And that responds with an NS record and says, for well, that part of the domain, you need to go and uh, speak to these servers over in Azure. So then we go to Azure and says, where is www.punksecurity.co.uk? And Azure says, oh, I know that one. Uh, this is the A record. So this is the IP address. BT then responds and puts that back on your computer. So your computer's now got an answer to that query. Um, it's got an IP address, it then sends traffic to that server and says, give me the website, and that all works wonderfully. On a future requests, what we actually see in DNS is there's lots of layers of caching. So in future, when someone says, where is um, dev.punksecurity.co.uk, BT is cached, that punksecurity.co.uk is over on Azure. 
So it's not going to go to the TLD. It's not going to go to the booting server. It's just going to go straight to Azure because it's cached it. And you can, that cache is configurable as different lifetimes. Typically, it's like an hour. It gets cached. And DNS is heavily cached because we don't want those routing servers getting hit with every single DNS request. Oof, so that is DNS in a nutshell, both infrastructure and how it works on your laptop. So what are subdomains? And this topic is obviously all about subdomain hijacking. So subdomains are those parts of the domains that you control. So in this instance, punksecurity.co.uk is a domain. So I've got the tld.co.uk. That's sitting over at Nominet. I've purchased Punk Security from them. So punksecurity.co.uk is the domain. And then I can add as many subdomains as I like, the www blog docs there. No cost to those. I just go on to whatever my DNS provider is, Azure, Cloudflare, AWS, and add a new subdomain. I can point it wherever I want, a website or a SFTP server, it doesn't really matter. Um, so those that is what we're talking about with subdomains. We're not gonna be taking over the full domain. We're looking at taking over those subdomain records that are provisioned. And on this slide, they're all green. And what are subdomain takeovers? Well, hopefully now it's uh, fairly obvious, but essentially we're gonna try and take those domains over. So for, because those domains have got misconfiguration that is detectable, we're gonna serve our own content from them. So in this case, on this slide, we've got docs.punksecurity.co.uk. Um, and actually we to get a lead into the first demo, which is the GitHub pages takeover. So in this scenario, that's pointing at GitHub Pages. GitHub Pages has no idea what docs.punksecurity.co.uk is. And um, we can then, as an attacker, detect that, go and provide our own solution via GitHub Pages, our own website. And then if someone was to go to docs.punksecurity.co.uk, they get served our malicious content. So these are what we're talking about with subdomain takeovers. So let's dive straight into that GitHub Pages takeover, because it's a really quite simple one to uh, get your head around. So uh, in this case, we have uh, punksecuritydocs.punksecurity.co.uk. So uh, I couldn't use docs because I, I burnt it on a previous demo. So uh, on this one, that's the, that's the domain. And when we do a ping to it, what happens is that DNS process we just discussed kicks off and we turn it into an IP address. And I've just highlighted that in this uh, part of the uh, output here. So I've pinged it and I've got an IP address. That IP address is a GitHub Pages IP address. There's only like four, I think there's two IP version four ones and two IP version six addresses that you could get back. So we know that this domain is served by GitHub Pages. So that's the first uh, step. The next step is to go to the domain. So if we go to the domain, we get a 404 and a page saying there isn't a GitHub site here. So the DNS lookup went through fine. We went for that whole process of going to the root and going to the TLD, going to whatever our DNS was, is your address or Cloudflare. And then that gave us a record to say, you need to go to GitHub Pages. So that all that process is is end-to-end is -end complete. But when we go to GitHub Pages, it knows nothing about that domain. So this is a condition that we can detect. And as an attacker, if we can then convince GitHub to serve our content under that domain, then we can well serve content under that domain. So uh, this is a very quick demo of how that works. Um, so I'll press play on this and get an art if you can see it. So I've got a repository here. I go into the settings. There's, there's a, um, a GitHub pages branch specified, which has got a load of uh, web content in there. I add the domain and GitHub now does a quick check um, and says, right, is that DNS record pointing at GitHub pages? And if it is, it's happy. So I'm, as an attacker, I've got no reason. There's no reason for GitHub to trust me more than anyone else. But it has done because the DNS flow was complete. So now, as you can see, if I refresh the page, I'm now serving the content out of my repository. So as an attacker with no authentication, no method of proving that that domain is mine, I can serve content for it. And that's because GitHub is happy to do the DNS check as proof that you own the domain because you've set it up to point it at GitHub pages. So we've seen an attack there where a administrator has set up a domain to point at GitHub pages and either they haven't done the GitHub pages set up yet or more likely they have years ago and they've decided that they don't want to use it anymore and they've deleted it. So now it's pointing the GitHub pages and it's not actually being used. So they've cleaned up the GitHub pages but not the DNS records. So, so how do DevOps make this worse? 
And the first thing really is a, is a, a really interesting quote uh, from, from Gene, uh, Gene Kim. If you follow sort of the DevOps um, research in academia, there's this whole pull in DevOps to focus on um, what's core to your product and all the context stuff like auth, um, et cetera, and, and, you know, parts, whole swathes of the app. If you, if it's not bespoke to your application, the argument quite often in the DevOps now is you shouldn't be dev in it. You should not waste developer time and effort reproducing something that you can buy off the shelf. It's almost never going to be as affordable and it's something else that could break. You've got to maintain, maintain dependencies, all that sort of stuff. So there's this huge drive to say, let's focus on what's core for your app and anything that's context, um, go and push it out elsewhere. Form rendering. Um, yeah, yeah, also a common one now. Let's go and use Okta. Let's not bother with Orf. Let's use Cognito. So when we do that and we ship more and more services to SaaS providers, um, naturally there's going to be more chance that we point records at SaaS services and then don't use them. So you know, rather than implement a, a a blog on our app, we'll just go and use a blogging service. Or rather than introduce a forum, we'll go and use a forum service. But then when we stop using them, we leave the records there. People can take them over. So this drive to say, actually, let's use more and more SaaS services and not host stuff inside ourselves is, is driving a lot of this. And then also, as developers are empowered now to, to use these SaaS services and also, you know, quite often under their own steam. So it's not for the IT person now in central ops to go and provision GitHub pages, for instance, or that forum. Maybe the developers are doing it themselves, doing a, you know, an enabled team, a highly agile, high velocity team they're developing systems and, and being able to provision infrastructure themselves but actually dns maybe they can't do that because ops have still got control over dns this is a pattern we see all the time and the interface with that is a ticketing system so typically a, a developer will go well i need to do a github pages thing so i've looked in the docs and i need to point this dns record at github pages github pages won't let me do that at the moment because the dns record is not pointing at it so i'll create a ticket and assign it to ops to say can you create me this um dns record so then ops do that and maybe the ticket doesn't come back straight away or it comes back in, it's not in that sprint that the developer's gonna do that or maybe they've just lost interest and forgotten about it. This interface of ticketing systems can quite often lead to work being, you know, a, a one week or two week gap between objectives being delivered even though it's, you know, a reasonably trivial thing to implement. And we see that quite a lot. So there's a bit of a race condition here where um, an attacker can detect and take over a domain before the ticket's been completed. So we're going to go on to um, the other type of attack now, which is NS delegation, so name server delegation. Um, this is why we covered NS records a bit more in detail at the start. So if we look at um, this DNS configuration here, we're back on punksecurity.co.uk, and it's sitting on that Azure server, and we've got a record for the website www. So that's all fine. Maybe Central Ops manage this. And what we're seeing now is, is these agile development teams, they want to be able to manage their own DNS, particularly if you're using services like Netlify or um, whatever the AWS equivalent is nowadays. You want to provision uh, maybe a, a, a web app on a pull request and it's sort of a unique domain, etc. So you end up with this situation where because of content security policies and cores and all that sort of stuff, it's really convenient to use a legitimate domain but equally, central ops and security are resistant to say, yes, you can go and provision your own records on our DNS. Um, you know, that's, there's a potential for a huge problem there. If you were to break something, you could bring down all services. So what we see is NS delegation. So in this instance, we've got punksecurity.co.uk and we create an NS record, dev.punksecurity.co.uk and we say to the developers, okay, will you go and provision your own DNS server somewhere in AWS, etc., and then we'll point dev.punksecurity.co.uk to that server via a name server record, exactly like the TLDs are doing with us. This is really simple to do. And then now, as a developer, you've got your own DNS server and anything that comes before .dev is under your control. So if you want to create www.dev or a pull request specific record .dev, you can do that straight away in your DNS in Route 3 and the chain's complete because now it goes root int, where is .co.uk, TLD, where is punk security? Next, send you over to Azure. Azure, where is dev.punksecurity.co.uk? Oh, that's over on the dev servers in Route 53 AWS. Boom, I'll go and ask those, and that completes the chain. 
So we can use this exact same trick to delegate parts of DNS control. We haven't got to worry now that the devs might accidentally remove www and break our main website. So this is just to see that pictorially. This is where we were before. We had the all that uh, the root hint, the TLD, and the your server. And now with the DNS record, we can send it over to a completely different DNS server, and it can serve all the same records. So there's no difference there. We just added an extra hop. So what is an NS takeover? It's very similar to what we saw before. Um, DNS now is predominantly provided by SaaS services. So you know historically, you might host your own DNS servers, but DNS is so critical and it needs to be so reliable. Typically now you're going to use Cloudflare, AWS as your um, or your registrars like GoDaddy, etc. So in this case, um, maybe because of the ticketing system, maybe because of a typo, um, maybe because it's not used anymore, we have uh, two NSF called set up, dev, which is working fine, be working beautifully, and then this uat.punksecurity.co.uk, which is an incorrect NS record, and we'll go into what that looks like in a moment. Basically, we've pointed at a DNS server that has no idea about this domain. So uh, much like we did with GitHub Pages, as an attacker, Typically, on a lot of these SaaS services, we can we can just provision our own records onto that server, um, and it's probably going to you know if it wants to do a check, well, we don't anyway, but if it wants to do a check, it's probably going to do a, a record check and say actually yes, it's pointing at me, so that's all good. So this is an NS takeover, and we're going to do this on AWS uh, Route Fifty Three. So in this instance, we have I'm going to quickly show you what this looks like to set this up. Um, so we have. Uh, AWS Weekly Free here with the punksecurity.co.uk top level, uh, you know, the domain that we want to create the delegation for. And in this very quick video, we're going to see what this looks like. So we create a hosted zone in AWS, click the button. We're going to type in um, dev.punksecurity.co.uk. So it's a completely different zone, completely separate from the main zone we've got. And when we, oh, I'm just going to put like a little note in here, developers, when we create the zone, um, it has got there the NS records. Go down there in a minute so we can see that we've created the zone dev.punksecurity.co.uk and then under ns records we can see four um servers and that's basically aws has picked up random some servers around the globe and provisioned our hosted zone onto it so to complete this flow now if we go back to the original uh, infrastructure uh, look we need to go back to the top level one and add the ns records to say where the person should go next and I'll just copy and pasted those out of the developer's uh, zone. So I've copy and pasted them in, and then now when you go through that flow, you'll get one of those and the path will be complete. So that's how simple it is to do delegation. Now, I don't know if you noticed in that video, but when I created the zone, I called it dev.punksecurity.co.uk, but then when I added it to the parent zone, I put developers.punksecurity.uk. So at this point, the dev zone is working and fully functional and servicing on those AWS name servers, but it's not internet um, resolvable because it's not on the parent domain. When you go to the parent domain and say, where's dev.punksecurity.co.uk, it has no idea. Just because they're both in AWS doesn't mean it's going to magically work. If you would go to it and say, where's developers.punksecurity.co.uk, it's going to say it's on these name servers. But when you go to the name servers, they have no idea what that is either because we never created a zone on them. So how can we exploit that? Well, we can just say, ask AWS to provision as an attacker, the developers.punksecurity.co.uk, and there's going to be no checks on it. Now, I did say that AWS had randomly put those records on servers around the globe. So we have to take that into account. We end up with a slight amount of brute forcing. The servers here, even though they're randomly allocated, aren't quite as random as you'd expect, and there aren't that many. So brute forcing is possible within sort of five minutes. It's not an exhaustive process. We do bump across, uh, bump against AWS rate limiting. We've got a bit of a demo, so we'll see that in a minute. So how can we exploit it? So when we created those records though, the, just then, um, it gave us the NS records. So it told us which servers um, it put the zone on. And then when we incorrectly set up the NS record pointer, we told it those exact same servers. So if I was to do an NS lookup now against uh, developers.punksecurity.co.uk, I would see these NS records. So as an attacker, I can just get those. So what we need to do now is go and ask AWS to provision us developers.punksecurity.co.uk and see what servers it puts us on. So in this scenario, that's exactly what we've done. We've got the target servers we want to get, and then AWS has responded and said, I've, I've put them on these. And as you can see, there's no matches at all.
So that is absolutely useless to us. We just basically delete the zone. It comes under any of us free tier. We haven't got to worry about it. And we ask them again. Now in this instance, I'm not sure why Aiden Rift does it in pairs, but we've got two of four. Now, this isn't too much of a problem because we can keep this one and then just go again. So if we get two of four and then they get another two of four and the overlap is that we've got all four, then we've got complete control anyway. It doesn't matter that we've scattered it on a couple of extra servers. It makes no odds at all. So in this case, that's great. We'll keep that. And then we do another request and we get the other two. So now we've got full control. At this point, there in our AWS account, we can add records. The flow works perfectly fine and we can serve up whatever we want from those, uh, from those DNS servers. So in this situation, how is DevOps making it worse? Typically, when we see NS takeover attacks, it's because of things like Terraform and copy and pasting. So provisioning stuff in AWS Route 53 is typically done now with Terraform or CloudFormation. And what we see is that people just copy and paste these blocks over. And it's not quite obvious on a pull request when you're looking at these sort of NS records that you spot that, that they're not right. So you might provision a record in AWS and then someone goes in and copies and pastes them into the pull request to update the parent zone. But it's not obvious that those records are correct. And what if we haven't updated them? What if we copy and pasted the block from another delegation we've done and not updated them? So infrastructure as code as good as it is and copy and pasting bits of code rather than doing it click ops, which is, which is I'm not saying don't do that. I absolutely advocate infrastructure as code, but this is a common cause of these sort of typos making it through and then these issues occurring. And then as you know, DevOps, with developers being enabled in small focus teams with all the ops and SRE and security support they need, delegation is more rife than ever. People want to be able to spin up web apps on pull requests, devs and UATs and all these different environments, and they don't want to be throttled by waiting on ops. So the delegation is obviously huge now. It's um, That's really booming. Um, so so what? Um, in fact, before I go on to this, I've got a quick demo of the brute forcing. So I'm just going to drag this over. Um, so I've got a, a quick view here of my AWS account, and I've got like, no hosted zones in it. So this is the attacker. And what we're going to do is take those exact servers I've just got on the slide there and try and brute force to get our zone onto them. So we've got no zones in there at the moment. I'm going to bring over uh, this terminal with VS Code. I've got a very quick Python brute force script for a brute force in AWS Bluetooth 3. I haven't released this anywhere, so uh, you can't get it. It's not massively difficult, but we don't tend to release it at all. So uh, at this point, every dot is just requesting a zone. So we are, as I said, as aggressive rate limiting on the AWS side. So we try and throttle it a little bit. We do sort of three at a time. So every dot is us requesting a zone. And if that zone then doesn't match any of the target records, um, we delete it and move on. So we just keep cycling through. And then hopefully, eventually, we will hit one of the servers that we want. And this uh, script will just output it to the command line and say that we've got that with the zone ID. And then it will carry on until we get all four. So hopefully we won't wait too long to see that and then we'll switch back to the AWS console and just see that we've achieved it. Um, as I said, there's nothing going on in AWS land now to say that I own punk, you know, this punksecurity.co.uk domain. This is just a random AWS account. So there's no checks going on to say that I should be able to do it. So as long as you can imagine that the flow is correct because we've spotted this condition, we should be fairly happy that this is a perfectly possible attack. There are some mitigations. This isn't always possible. So just because you detect this attack doesn't mean it's always possible. I will caveat that. So if you recently had it in AWS and deleted it off, it marks those particular zones like out of scope, but no one can request them. And obviously they don't release the exact details of that. So there won't be like, a, oh, but in three months time you can request them or six months time, or if it's provisioned on so many other servers that it's unavailable, that they don't tell you how to circumvent it essentially. Um, but this demo is going absolutely fantastic because we haven't found a single match yet. Um, but yes, they won't tell you how to circumvent it. You could probably do a little bit of research into it. So sometimes this will work straight away. Sometimes it's a bit of a long brute force. Um, I might just leave this running. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we finally got the first one. So NS99, um, we have managed to put that zone onto that. So I've just obviously picked a, a domain there. So that is how you would set up this attack. And then we've also got 766 now, 
Um, and if we go back, if I move the head away and go back into AWS, we might push against the rate limiting here. Yeah, we go. So we can see the, the zones it's created. Um, and then of these, some of them will have the correct name server records, which is what we're after. So we've brute forced that and now we've, we've uh, managed to take over that uh, NS record. I'm just going to stop this Python script. Okay, so 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 what? So an attacker can either take over a particular domain or with the NS record take over a lot all the subdomains beneath it. So what? What can they do with that? So the first obvious one is credible phishing links. We tell our users and our customers to make sure, you know to check that the links that they get purporting to come from us are legitimate. And that's a huge part of the, the human layer of defense against phishing and malware. These are legitimate taken over domains from HackerOne. So HackerOne is a bug bounty platform and they do a lot of public disclosure. So um, if someone takes over a domain via that platform, they'll get a reward and um, ask the company if they can disclose. So you can go on there and just go through some of the ones that have been taken over. So these are legitimate ones. So uh, the Uber one, I think, is really interesting. So signup.uber.com. If you got a, you know, an email from Uber saying, oh, you know, um, you need to, you, you've signed up um, to Uber and you owe us fifty dollars, or sign up now and get hundred dollars free Uber things, etc. Um, and it's legitimate URL. There's like no way that you can see that it's not legitimate. Then you're probably gonna be more susceptible to it. So that's the first thing, credible phishing links. When we look at NS takeover, we have a slightly different um, vector there. So now we've got the ability to send and receive mail from those domains because we can control all the records. So we, did, we briefly touched upon different types of records. One's MX for mail. Um, here, again, these are the, the legitimate URLs taken over. So help at signup.uber.com. So maybe we're gonna send an email now from signup.uber.com saying, oh, you know, you signed up, here's some money, Did you, was this definitely you sort of thing. Um, you can respond to that email and the attacker can then respond to you and it's all legitimate and it's not like a weird spoofed email address. So there's obviously a huge amount of power there in what you can do with the takeovers. And then this last attack vector is the most interesting and it does require a, almost a second misconfiguration um, with, with some cookies on a, on a web app. But again, it's something we see that's relatively common particularly on microservice apps which span multiple subdomains um, so let's briefly cover what a loose scope cookies and why you should uh, care about that so this is the punk security website and i've just brought up the cookie tab so you can see what's going on in our cookies so we use calendarly for some calendar scheduling um, and cloudflare have handily added a token presumably for some traffic steering or something so we've got three cookies on our website there and uh, you can see that they all on the domain column there, they all start with a dot. I'm not sure if that's coming out on the video. So it's dot calendar.com is the domain. Uh, and then we've got a punksecurity.co.uk and that starts with a dot as well. So these cookies, this is legitimate straight our website, these cookies are loosely scoped. So because that dot is starts with a dot on the domain, any subdomain that a user goes to, so dev.punksecurity.co.uk, will receive those cookies. So this is an important um, an important issue for security. So if there wasn't a dot there, that cookie, which is sent automatically without any user interaction, that cookie would only get sent to people visiting punksecurity.co.uk. They went to www. They wouldn't get it. So if you've got um, a misconfiguration in your app or a poor misguided configuration, you might say that an auth session token is required on different parts of your app. It's needed on the forum and the blog. So they go to auth and they get an, a session token scoped to dot app.com, whatever your app's called. And now wherever domain they go to, that cookie goes over and you can that's log in again. That's all just, you know, they get the session token and they can consume those services and you know who they are, which sounds idyllic, but actually means that if an attacker takes over any single subdomain, then those the, the session cookies of the user are going to flow that way. So let's just see that uh, visually so we fully understand what's going on there. So in this, you know, as I say, in, if an attacker was to take over a single subdomain 
and the loose scope cookies run from security.co.uk for sessions that you just logged in. Then as an attacker, if I can just trick a person to go into docs.punk.security.co.uk, I can get those cookies. And it can be as simple as um, I'll put an image tag somewhere, you know, so um, maybe I go on uh, a, a, another website and I pop an image tag on there that says go and get this image from docs.punk.security.co.uk. You know, it's an image of a cat meme or something. So it renders. The person doesn't really realise what's going on there, but actually their browser's made a web request over to docs.punk.security.co.uk and when it's done that, it's sent all the cookies. So just by go, just having an image tag, we can steal their session tokens. Um, so there's a lot of danger to loose scope cookies when we talk about subdomain takeovers. So let's have a look at what um, that looks like. So in this demo, which I think we should not play automatically this time, uh, what I've done is I've just spoofed host records for example.org. Um, so this is example.org and they haven't got any cookies. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a cookie. So let's go in here and we'll create a cookie. Um, I can't remember what I call it now. It's auth, an auth cookie. And um, give it a value. Now the domain there has been tightly scoped out of the box. So as you've added that cookie into the dev console, it doesn't start with a dot. So it'll only ever go to example.org. So we put a dot in front of it now to loosely scope it. Let's just get that done. So we've changed it now. So that cookie goes to anything.example.org. And then what we've done is we've um, fired the host file here. We've just uh, pretended we've got a subdomain takeover in the example.org DNS space. So we'll see that now. We've got we're a quick Python web server. And all that does is it's just going to dump out the headers we get when, when uh, people browse that page. Uh, it's a really trivial thing to do. So we're going to now browse the taken over subdomain site. So here we go, subdomain.example.org. And as soon as we do that, I'll highlight it here on the left. You can see the cookie came over, of cookie equals secret. So as soon as they browse that, we haven't done anything. There's no weird JavaScript going on. As soon as you browse that, you get the cookie. And if I go in here now and remove the dot so the cookie is scoped only to that domain and refresh the page and then just let the terminal run you see the cookie's gone so in the case where we've got a loosely scoped cookie subdomain attacks become much more problematic because now we can start to leverage a subdomain takeover with the loosely scoped cookie attack and then vulnerability and now we've got a much bigger attack we can start stealing session tokens etc and, and are targeting the app that way Okay, so that is the two attack vectors that we were looking at, which is taking over a generic SaaS service and um, behind a subdomain and then doing an NS takeover attack. And then we've looked at what an attacker can do with these subdomains once they've got them. So how do we defend against it? So um, DNS hygiene is really important. So um, this just typically doesn't happen. DNS is quite often in almost all organizations seen as a set and forget. So you'll go and configure it, but you'll never tidy it up afterwards. It's, it's just a chore that doesn't happen. It's not seen as an issue. Um, so just auditing DNS and maybe having a removal process um, is a good place to start. Uh, bug bounty programs. So as I mentioned earlier, the Hacker One program, there are other programs. There are uh, researchers who will be looking for this sort of stuff. So you can get on that program, put a nominal fee uh, uh, reward on there and people will report it when they see it. Um, extending pen testing scopes. So this is a real passionate point of mine, particularly coming from the DevSecOps side. Pen testing is still very much focused on web app, big ticket OWASP top 10 attacks, or info attacks with vulnerability scanning and those sort of things. We st still don't see much traction on pen tests for looking at what's the state of your Git repos, what's the state of your file servers, what's the state of your DNS, all these auxiliary services you've got, how are they configured and actually are they open to abuse? So extending pen testing scopes is, 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 is something I'd hope to see. And then um, we at Punk Security have built a tool called DNS Reaper to automate the process of finding these attacks. So when we looked at the GitHub Pages attack, for instance, we said actually there's a few IPs and it might be for GitHub Pages. And the page has got some fairly static content on there to say that there's no GitHub Pages site here. 
well, that's obviously dead easy to programmatically check. So we've got around 60 signatures now uh, on DNS Reaper. Um, and that's essentially what it does. It does DNS checks and it does web checks, correlates the two to see if there's a, a, a potential attack vector that you need to just have a look at. Um, so I'm going to quickly go on to DNS Reaper uh, now. So it's a, a Docker container. It is a Python-based tool, so you can run it in Python if you want, but we always advocate running it in Docker. That's what's good for uh, functional testing. So um, you, and I will say DNS Reaper is completely open source, by the way, so feel free to fork it, extend it, raise issues. Um, it's not, there's no uh, paid for um, model to it. There's no licensing. It, you know, just open source. Um, so yeah, so DNS Reaper, you can either give it domains, you can give it a domain on the command line, you can give it a list of domains in a file, um, or you can have it fetch them. So really the power is in fetching them. So you can, if you run it in AWS, you can just, in, in like a um, ECS container or something, uh, or an EC2, you can just have it assume a role, but, um, and it'll try and do that actually just out of the box. Or yeah, for the Azure Cloudflare, you basically give it API keys, it will go into your environment, it will pull all your DNS records. So you haven't got to really worry about it. You can run some on a, on a you know, daily schedule, for instance. Um, so it get, gets domains, effectively. It gets all those records. And it tests them, as I say, with nearly 60 signatures. And we pattern match the record to say, does it match this criteria for what this for what um, signature this might be? And then we have a look at the web response. So the false positive rate is really, really low. Um, and then it just outputs nicely to the screen to say if you've got any attacks, we'll see that in a second. And you also get a CSV and a JSON output. So if you did want to, you know, as a pen tester, if you were bringing this into the scope of what you were doing, or you just wanted a one-time audit, CSV, open it in Excel or Google Sheets, and you can have a look at that data. If you want to be programmatic with it, obviously you've got JSON there, so you can then pivot the data. Um, so what are the use cases for DNS Reaper or auditing DNS configuration? Um, Typically, we see an organization will be carrying a huge amount of debt. So actually, a, a DNS attack might not um, come back for three months, six months. There's a low likelihood that a service goes through this uh, process or gets decommissioned. But actually, they've not been checked for 10 years. So um, an initial audit is generally quite fruitful. Um, you can use it to scan for bounties. People are doing this on automated platforms. They use this as a detection engine. It's got about 1,600 stars now on GitHub, um, so it's quite a popular tool, about 1,500 Docker pools. Um, and then prevent bad deployment. So it is built to run in a pipeline as well. So what you can do as part of your deployment is you would update uh, AWS Route 3, for instance, get to do the scan, it will fail the pipeline if um, it detects a, de a detection, uh, detects a takeover opportunity, you can then go nip that in the bud. If you're doing a blue-green DNS deployments, which we don't see that often, but you know there's a potential there for really uh, risk-conscious organisations with um, particularly um, dedicated um, for actors, you could do a blue-green deployment where you update DNS. Uh, DNS Reaper will pull your records in and treat them as if they are the live records, scan it, and you could prevent that um, switchover of zone. So that's another option. Um, what we also typically see with DNS, just to go back to that, is that when you make a change, because of the way DNS caching works, you might, uh, if you add a record, people can access it pretty much straight away. But if you were to like, remove a record, um, then that can be quite slow because it's cached. People will still be able to resolve it. So there's a potential that we can catch situations before they turn into uh, attacks. Um, so this is what DNS Reaper looks like. So a bit of ASCII art. You can see all the providers there. So we support zone transfer. If you've got traditional DNS server running bind or Windows, enable zone transfer, whitelist the IP that, that DNS Reaper is coming from. That's all that zone transfers need. And we'll just fetch all your records via zone transfer and test them. You can provide a file where we load the domains in. Um, you can have it connect to Cloudflare and fetch those. AWS, exactly the same. Same with DigitalOcean and Azure. So we'll fetch all those records. You can provide it a bind file. So if you've got a service like GoDaddy or something and we haven't got a provider for it, but they support bind export, you can export it and feed it into Reaper and we'll scan it that way. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can get Reaper to ingest domains to try and save you a bit of effort when you're doing an audit. And then this is what the output looks like. So uh, we've got three records from AWS. This is actually the attack we demoed. And then we've got the same record reported twice um, just because it, there's one with a potential confidence. So what's happened there is we've noticed there's a, 
DNS record provided. And when we connect to that DNS server, DNS server knows nothing about it. So there's a potential that we can take that over. We see quite a lot that when that happens, maybe the, the, the DNS server you're pointing at is like an elastic IP or something in someone's infrastructure that no way an attacker is going to be able to control and therefore it's not a real thing. But it could be a SaaS service we haven't got another signature for. So we get a potential finding. There's an ARG switch you can disable potential findings. Um, and then we've got the confirmed one. So actually, not only did we notice that that DNS server knew nothing about it, um, it matched the AWS signature. And we know that AWS is a SaaS provider of Hurupt3 DNS and you can take it over. So uh, we've got a confirmed finding. So quite useful to keep potentials on, um, but if you did want less noise on the output, you could toggle it off. Uh, we say, yeah, run it with it on, and then the CSV, if there's too much noise, you can just say, don't do potentials. Um, as you can see, it did that in 1.68 seconds. It is really fast to do this. Um, I've never tested an organization that's taken um, more than about six or seven seconds. It's There's no concern. Don't, don't disable potential to save time because uh, it's really fast. Um, so it's, as I say, it's on GitHub. Uh, this was taken a few months ago. So it's on one, one and a half thousand stars at this point. Uh, all the documentation is on there. So if you want to set it up for AWS or Cloudflare, you go into that docs folder and there'll be a guide for how to set it up. So this is the AWS one. This is basically the minimum permissions you need, which is just to get and list some DNS records. Um, so you can just create the role. You can feed the AWS keys. But as I say, if you run it in AWS, in an AWS pipeline or ECS or EC2, it will, you can just assume that role through standard sort of BOTO3 Python means. Uh, you haven't got to worry about providing keys and stuff. Um, so yeah, that's all documented on the, on, on GitHub. Uh, so that is the end of uh, this evening's talk. So what are subdomains? How does DNS work? What are subdomains? How do we take them over with two different attack methods? A couple of demos for doing that, those attacks, obviously brute forcing uh, Ruby 3 earlier and uh, what you should care and what you can do about it. And hopefully, you know, go and have a look at DNS Reaper, go and have a look at your own DNS, but there's, you know, you save yourself a bit of time with DNS Reaper. And uh, hopefully we see less of these attacks um, as we go forward. Um, as a bit of a shameless plug as well, uh, Punk Security, uh, to celebrate our second birthday this year, we're doing a DevSecOps theme CTF. So if anyone's up for that, uh, that's on May the 4th. Um, so that's the 4th of May uh this year so what's that that is uh oof, just about three and a half months away now and yeah devsecops theme so there'll be subdomain takeovers attacks uh they'll be abusing SaaS services uh aws abusing access keys and looking to do stuff that way kubernetes breakouts um we've got you know rather than traditional ctf um challenges around passwords uh we're doing cracking jwts and ansible vaults and um Traditional, the hack, I don't know if, you know, if anyone's ever done a CTF before, they are basically bite sized challenges to get you exposed to technology with a security theme. And in this one, we're going to be focusing DevSecOps. So, how to abuse things in Git, how to abuse CI CD, um, and all those sort of things. So, hopefully, it's going to be really good. Um, and yeah, if you can make it, that's May the 4th. So, shameless plug, our website's down there at the bottom right. Yeah, you can go over there and get some more detail on the CTF. Uh, as we release it. Thank you very much for uh, for attending. If any questions at all, uh, reach out to me uh, on the Discord channel. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks.